Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Alt Reports Radio, where today I'm happy to sit down again with Anar Volset, VC, uh, M&A guy, and various what other things that people love to hate. Everybody, yeah, everybody loves to hate the M&A VC guy. <laughs> well, I'm going to join right in yeah, and, yeah, uh, and hate with him. Yeah, we should really so, talk about crypto today, given how the market is completely uh, selling shit. off because the I know we should talk about the crap. <laughs> well, let's talk about crypto for a moment. But then I think you wanted to talk about something uh, about which I have almost no idea at all. Uh, okay. I didn't even realize it was like an asset class or an investment until uh, just recently, which is watches, which is like high end um, uh, expensive watches. And so... Uh, I, I'm looking forward to you educating me on that because I'm a complete idiot. Uh, but yeah, I guess maybe we could talk briefly about the implosion that's happening in um, Bitcoin uh, and crypto right now. As usual, the, it's, the, it's the normal day in crypto when everything is going to shit. So yeah. that's not crypto <laughs> for it. No, I mean, we have to talk a lot about it. I just thought it was interesting. The, the news today was that FTX was being bought by uh, basically the Binance, the, the basically one crypto exchange, basically it looked like it became illiquid. That was the big yeah. thing with FTX. Sa Sam, what's his name? Sam Bankman Freed, something like that. Yes, SBS. Mr. Like billionaire, like he's been all yeah. over the place. Yeah. You know, he was actually one of Biden. Did you know this? He was one of Biden's biggest donors. Uh, in oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cash donors. And he's been actually one of the leading lights of the um, effective altruism movement too. Um, and so what, what I, I wasn't paying close attention to it. Um, although I did just buy some Ethereum, which was a terrible timing for me as usual. But, uh, uh, from, from what I'm understanding, they, they, um, there, there was some of the questions about liquidity of, of FTX, the exchange itself. So people were starting to question whether they had the underlying, where the underlying funds were gone and, and obviously it's all crypto, right? So you can just look on the on the balance on the on the ledger to see what's going sure. on like yeah, where, on where these are being and yeah so normally what you would expect is if there's a liquidity crunch for something like this is that that a, an exchange like that has a a significant number you know amount of crypto in its cold wallet and so you would mm. see expect to see the cold wallet come online and start funding but that never seemed to happen so instead mm. what seemed to happen was at least this is my understanding of it um, uh, what seems to happen was that an, an affiliated entity, Alameda Research, which is more of a VC fund, started like mm -hmm. sending them liquidity. But which also primarily basically, like, held by uh, the same guy, SBF, Sam Beckman. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so then the question is like, wait, is there not a cold wallet? Is in fact what's been going on, in fact, is that um, FTX has been taking customer funds in, and shipping it to Alameda Research, and they've been doing investments with the customer funds. That's that's oh, basically geez. what. The, yeah, because mm. there's no cold wallet that came online, and then yeah, the the Binance, the other um, based in China, or at least used to be based in China, yeah. uh, exchange. All of a sudden, this morning, there was like, yeah, we're being acquired. There's a non-binding LOI saying that Binance will basically uh, provide the liquidity and will acquire all of FTX. Which yeah. is a hell of a fall from grace. <laughs> it, yeah, it really is. I mean, I mean it was like for a while, like they were going to buy everything. FTX was. Um, yeah, I mean, they bailed out. I mean, FTX was the was and Sam was the guy. He was bailing out, you know, all the the the, the last crap that happened, you know, yeah. with the three arrows and all that stuff. Toquan. They they were sort of the the white knight in that scenario. So now yes. the argue the question is really fundamentally the question is were all those funds that were being used to bail out the white knight shenanigans that was used to bail out and buy all these other assets. Was that all customer assets from <laughs> FTX that should have been in a cold wallet? So it's good. Well, I mean, I think what's good is that we're bound to see some regulation soon and this sort of thing should be, you know, reduced. Although at the same time, it's never not going to be, like a global asset, you know? So there's yeah. only so much regulation that we're, we're going to be able to do. I think probably what it'll mean is that we'll be, as Americans, restricted from more things um, as yeah. we are now. There's, we're much more limited than the rest of the world in terms of what we can do legally in uh, crypto these days. 
um, including, you know, exchanges and margin and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but a big prominent failure like this is going to beg for some regulation. I just hope that it is the um, CFTC and not the SEC, because yes. I think that if it were, if indeed it is a commodity, which I, I believe it to be, especially Bitcoin, uh, because it's not offering some kind of yield, um, then then hopefully that does fall under, hopefully that is in fact a, uh, a commodity and not a security. So I guess we'll just have to see, uh, it's gonna, frankly, mess up. I don't know what my thesis becomes if it, we discover that uh, most of crypto is a, a, a security, but there is also a, a class, um, I'm sorry, a case against a token uh, called Library, L-B-R-Y, I don't know if you saw that, that mm -hmm. the SEC brought against them that yesterday, now I don't know when you're going to be listening to this, we're today we're, we're talking on November, on Tuesday, on election day, let's not talk about elections. Um, Let's not do that. And, uh, and library lost their case against the SEC, saying that uh, that library, which isn't a token I'm familiar with, but regardless, the point is that it's crypto that the SEC said was a security and uh, the judge agreed. So, you know, of course, there'd be appeals and all that kind of stuff, but, but uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, I think in the Not U.S., the what's thing. it called? Is it the Howey test, the Huey test, something like that? Yeah. Which is mm -hmm. the definition of what the, what's the security. And I think in a lot of the, these yes. cases, there's a very strong argument that says they should be. <laughs> yes. Because you're the, the, the Howey test or Huey test, or however you pronounce it, is, um, I think it's Howey. And this won't be the first name I'm butchering on this call. But, um, you know, it says that, you know, you put money in and you expect to get gains from other people's, like passive income from other people's, you know, efforts type thing. Yeah, uh, you know, I think for some of them, that's definitely going to be a security. I what agree I, with I that. Uh, however, when we talk about things like uh, Bitcoin, I don't think that's the case because there's no uh, anything. No, I think that's where... true. I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, I think are definitely assets. That would that's how I think about it. Come on, but some of these things with like the yield yeah. and the gender and the thing and the weirdness, like it's yeah, that's more like a security. If you're getting of, yield guess and you're not doing anything. If then that is the definition of a security, right? If if you're if there's like passive yield that somebody else is responsible for, yeah. that's the security. So I think so. Yeah. And this is not so we're going to talk about the other shady uh, commodity and asset class that uh, has been. I mean, everybody who was making money in crypto, they were buying watches. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, so I don't get this at all. I don't wear a ring or a watch of any kind. Um, and I started seeing much more talk about this just over the last year or so. All of a sudden, everybody's talking about sure. watches and, uh, and I yeah. don't know anything at all. So so educate me. It sounds to me. So you you really just... don't know anything like, you know, you don't know the difference between a mechanical watch and a quartz watch like this, this not zero. Zero. I know zero about watches. I um, I had a fake Movado when I was um, in high school. I don't know if that counts yeah. for anything. I had a fake. Yeah. We can talk about fake watches too. I had a fake Rolex. I think my dad brought back from somewhere in Asia when I was like nine years old or something like that. Yeah. Well, I hope he paid um, the right amount. <laughs> yeah, I think he paid like ten bucks or something for it probably at the time. So tell um, me about this. Are you wearing uh, fifty thousand dollar watches and investing no. in these and putting them in safety deposit boxes? I, What's just, I just like watches. So fundamentally, if you don't know anything about watches, like mm. there's like let me show you. Like I don't, I don't know if you're on video here, but like here's a watch, and it's uh this one. You see it? Okay. This is actually yeah. an interesting one. This is the Omega Swatch, the Speedmaster okay. watch. Um. Um, and it's a quartz watch and actually the quartz watch is basically battery driven. So in the sixties okay. or so, uh, I think it was around then was like the quartz revolution, which basically like watches used to be mechanical watches, right? They used to be actual physical things. So for example, that you wind, that you wind or can, or there's two kinds of mechanical watches, like manually wound and automatics and manual bounds. You, you like, this one is a, is a manual wind. 
and it looks like you can see the back of it in some cases, right? You can see this movement. There's an actual, this is called a movement, the actual physical mechanical pieces. And it's actually metals and springs and things like that, that move around and store energy that either because you manually wound it or because you have an automatic movement, which basically means you move your hand and then, uh, or, or, you know, your body. And then, um, uh, it, it, there's a, there's a winding thing that winds up the main spring. Okay. Um, so, so fundamentally there's sort of mechanical watches and quartz watches. And when people talk about watches as investment, they're almost always talking about mechanical watches. So like there are people like the reason I like watches is because I like mechanical watches because they're not technical. <laughs> okay. Like they're not, they don't have a battery you need to change. They don't have a computer. They're not going to beep. Mm. Like they'll just keep working. Like it's quite amazing to me that you can have like a physical mechanical machine on your wrist that keeps exact time to within like plus minus three seconds a day. Like hmm. that to me is an amazing thing in and of itself. Um, yeah. Versus cord watches are actually more accurate. So if you buy a $10, like, you know, Timex or something, uh, it'll keep better time than the, even a, you know, half a million dollar, you know, Patek Philippe or whatever. Um, okay. So it's not really, oh yeah, yeah. Like this is watch is the brand? most accurate. This is the, this is the most accurate watch that I own. Uh, this one here, and it's a quartz watch that runs on a battery. Um, and it okay. basically uses atomic time, basically, effectively. Hmm. Um, but yeah, that, those are the fundamental things. And other than that, it's it because it's interesting because it's a it's entirely in my book, a brand thing, you know, okay. like, like the physical, uh, you know, th there are certainly def you know, differences between, you know, a watch, which costs, you know, say, 500 bucks and one that costs 50,000. But in terms of accuracy and actually like, you know, how good quote unquote the watch is, there's very little yeah. difference between the two a lot of the time. Like if you end up buying a five, spend 500 bucks, a thousand bucks on a mechanical watch or an automatic watch, you're getting one that's probably technically roughly as, as sophisticated as one that's like a, certainly 5,000 or 10,000, something like that. Um, so, so it ends up being a brand thing. So what do you know about how these things perform or behave over time? Is it just that we had a wild blow off top in all asset prices last year, or have these things maintained value over the decades or what? Tell me a little, what do you know about that? Yeah. So actually one of the best places to look at this and you can see sort of graphs of, of costs um you know there's a couple of different ways to do it the one that i like the best is called watch charts so you can go in and it's an it's a website and an app um you can go out and you can say okay what is the market index so they scrape all the listings of mechanical watches well watches anywhere um and and so for example here is the market index which shows the average obviously cost as you can see, that goes, you know, down basically to the right, the last six months. If I look back three years, um, I think you can probably see where the, uh, the blow off top was, um, which correlates. It's actually, it seems to be early this year, February, March, 2022 is sort of when the, when the, when the top blew off, but certainly you can see like, particularly it, it definitely relates to like a younger, I think right about, you know, probably around COVID times, mm. around that time, there was a lot of money around. It started yeah. getting even more money around. And like the yeah. younger generation started to, to, to care about watches. So the mm. thing about watches is like, it's, it's, it, it's an investment or an asset class and an investment, but it's also like a large part of it is sort of the, um, uh, the kudos that comes with it and the signaling effect. Right. So yeah. if you wear a certain watch, you, the, most people won't notice, but the people who notice, notice, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you're wearing sure. a $20,000 watch, yeah. other people who care about watches will instantly know that you're wearing a $20,000 watch. Mm. Uh, and mm. that's partly what you're into it for. Like that's unlike a lot of other asset classes, right? In, in a way, watches are like the, really the only acceptable in my book, jewelry that men can wear. <laughs> Women can show off with all sorts of things. Men, you yeah. can't, I mean, you can maybe wear a gold chain, maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe not if you're you me, have to but, be from but, New know, Jersey, like, but you yeah. have to be from New Jersey. You have to be a sports star, right? But like a watch, anyone can wear, and particularly if you're a guy, that's kind of the only, your only signaling. And like that's not true for most other asset classes, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't show off your your taste, your wealth, your whatever it is that you want to do uh, by you know you're not going to carry around a you know 
a spy document that shows you how much how you shorted tesla like that's super hard to do right right so so that's part of it pretty too. cool though <laughs> that's what you want we can, like, a yeah, we can, like a little uh, like a little badge like a little like sticker yeah, yeah. maybe the qr code that uh identifies successful <laughs> shorts yeah, yeah, yeah but um but yeah i mean that's what it boils down to like people are into it there are people there's sort of different classes of nerds right there are people who, who are like you know into watches for the hmm. for the what's called the complications and the interesting and the mech. so uh, a complication it would be like things that a mechanical watch can do so like there's keeping time and then yeah. there's the date window, which is one uh, complication. Um, and there are others too, like, you know, there are uh, moon phases and, and, and various things that people can do. And there are people who are, who are, who are nerds about that specifically. And then there are peeps, people who are like into specific brands. So people co will collect, you know, either new watches or vintage watches from a certain brand. So they'll be into 1970s Rolexes or something like that. So um, everybody knows. The and then there's a higher end, which is. Rolex, but what are the Sorry? other names out there uh, other than Ro I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, there's sort of like a complete, yeah, noob. complete noob. So if you look at the major ones, so there's sort of like there's Rolex, which is the main, um, I'm looking at brands here, uh, which is the main, it's, it's sort of the, it, it's weird because Rolex isn't like the most prestigious brand, but it's the most okay. well known brand. Um, yeah. So if you're really into watches, a lot of the time you will care about. There's sort of the, what's called the holy trinity of um, of watches, which are sort of the old school. And most of the most of the brands that are mechanical are, tend to be Swiss. So it's all you know Swiss watches. In some cases, German, uh, occasionally Japanese, but fundamentally they're mostly Swiss. So you got. Um, I'm going to butcher the names now because I never really know how you pronounce them. <laughs> it, well, uh, your is one of, them. of your roots. Yeah. That's right. Um, so the ones that really people care about would be things like uh, Vacheron Constantin, uh, Patek Philippe, and uh, let's see here. Uh, this one I really don't know how to pronounce. It's I think it's French. So it's Georges Lecoultre, but it's um, it's pronounced. Okay. It looks like this: Jaeger Lecoultre. If you're German, um, so that's okay. one of them. Grand Seiko is probably the only one that's like out of Japan. That's like a big one. Um, and then there's more sort of what people consider fashion watches that are like, you know, Cartier, um, you know, the square tank Cartier watch is probably one of the most iconic ones. And, um, hmm. and then you have some that are like, uh, you know, the more micro brands that can be very high end. So like most of these watches, like most of the brands are actually owned by some of the same, same companies. So for example, hmm. the company that makes Swatch, you know, the, the, um, uh, the cheap plastic watches. They also own Omega, yeah. which is one of the older, larger mechanical, uh, mechanical watchmakers in Switzerland. So, um, but then you have the smaller players who are like, um, and, and most of them are, you know, made by Swatch. And actually most wa mechanical watches that sell are some sub brand of Swatch. Rolex itself is actually uh, a not for profit. It turns out, uh, they're probably pump out the hmm. most watches. Um, but then there's sort of the micro brands, um, where. You know they hand make watches and they make maybe 10 a year and they sell them for like a couple of hundred thousand dollars a, a piece you know something like that <laughs> um but fundamentally on the high end so rolex is sort of middle most of the rolex watches are, are what i would call high end but not uber high end so they're you know you can buy a, at retail you could buy a you know rolex submariner for about 10 grand something like that um versus if you okay. want to protect belief like on the high end, it's going to cost you 40, 50,000 bucks. Um, and then you have some okay. of the really crazier ones, like probably the, the craziest one, which tend to be like the footballer watches are like Richard Mille, like that guy, have you seen these watches? They're basically like square see-through skeletonized. I should send you a link of it, what it looks like, cause it's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, we'll drop some links on the show, net, show notes and on the, the, uh, in the, at the site. Yeah, I'll do that. Let me just show you. Richard Mille. I think here's you can share for, your screen. Here's one for four hundred and nineteen thousand dollars. Can you see that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Looks yeah, like so a it's watch. basically half a million. This is a half a million dollar watch. Okay. And it's not an antique. It's, it looks pretty modern. No. It, 
Just recently... limited edition brand stuff. The, the thing, it all, beca- all becomes brand. It becomes like basically brand stuff. Like the story, like a good example, and, and actually emblematic of what happened with, with prices is, is if you look at Rolex. Because Rolex, they generate a shit ton of watches. And certainly some of their vintage catalog is, you know, is, is sells for a lot more money than they did. But mm-hmm. actually, like a modern Rolex watch would also sell for more money than you can if you could buy it at retail, but you can't buy it at retail. <laughs> okay. So there's like authorized Rolex dealers, and they obviously they have to sell it at whatever price it is. So, for example, you know, like a no date Submariner might cost you, you know, at retail nine thousand seven hundred bucks. But okay. you know, there's a there's a Rolex dealer in San Jose, uh, close to where I live, and but I can't go over there with nine thousand seven hundred bucks and buy one. Um, I have, there's like a wait list and often those wait lists can be long and they yeah. will, it is not just first come first serve. It ends up being some sort of like, you know, relationship, how much jewelry have you bought at this dealer before? What other watches have you bought? You know, it becomes more of that. Um, is the market like this all the time or is this because of supply shortages right now? So I think. With Rolex in particular, I think what it started out, not as supply shortages, but it became a thing. Like I said, the market took off in that sense that like the younger generation decided that watches was a thing right around Mm. sort of COVID times, 2019, 2020. And that then uh, was exacerbated by some of the supply shortages that we saw uh, after, like lately. But I think it suits Rolex down to the T that you can't just go and buy that the gray market, you know, the aftermarket, basically the same Submariner is going to cost you probably 15 grand now versus mm-hmm. like, you know, only six months ago, you probably have to pay 20,000 for a newish Submariner. Um, and do so all it ends up trains... being, I mean, it ends up, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Like, but it's, it's, like I said, I think the reason why it's, why it exists is because it's one of the only acceptable ways for men to wear jewelry. There's a signaling yeah. effect there, but I also yeah. think there's a fair amount of like black market stuff that goes on with watches. Like they become tradable commodities that are very hard to trace mm. <clears throat> in a way. Hmm. So I was reading the story about like people who sell dodgy cars with strange provenances and things, basically saying like in order to avoid, you know, registration to pay taxes and full taxes on it. They may sell a twenty thousand dollar car for, you know, uh, twenty thousand, like a, a hundred thousand dollar car for like uh, seventy five thousand dollars instead, mm-hmm. and then just hand them a gold Rolex on the side too, because mm-hmm. it's easy. Then you don't have to report that to the tax man. Um, so it become like certainly in the black markets, things the higher end watches that keep their value well have become you know part of the economy to to sort mm-hmm. of keep taxes uh, to keep the tax man away. So where do these things trade? Are the like are you just going to eBay to buy them or is there like how do you know where to go so that when you're buying you're not getting duped? Yeah. So or, that's a that's an yeah. interesting question because like in addition so so obviously the best is if you can find an authorized dealer <laughs> most of the time. If you can sure. find an authorized dealer willing to sell 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 you a watch at retail, that's that's your best bet obviously. But that's mm. particularly in some cases like Rolex, that's very hard to do. And so really what you want to do is to find a, a, a trusted dealer. So there's there's a subset of dealers that, um, you know, they're gray market dealers, Crown and Caliber is one. Hodinki is actually one of the uh, websites that are very focused on on watch culture and they have a, a secondary market. And there's a subset of, of secondary dealers where sort of it's known that they verify their watch as well. Now, eBay is interesting because... They actually, for all their watches now, they include a authentication guarantee. So if you buy a watch on eBay, the seller actually has to send it to one of their authenticators. They do the authentication and then they send it back to you um, okay. before the transaction closes. So, but but there's no doubt that there's an awful lot of uh, fake watches out there, and the the yeah. watch the fake watches are actually getting good to the point where it's actually quite hard, even if you know what you're looking for, to tell that a, a, a watch is fake. And in some cases you end up like, so again, like I told you, like most of the time, the, the, the mechanical differences aren't, you know, that huge between an expensive watch and non-expensive watch. And particularly if they're using like third-party movements. So, 
uh, uh, like a brand like Panerai, they don't make their own movements. Like they don't make the actual guts of the, the watch themselves. They buy something from okay. ETA. This is a Swatch provider as well. And then they put that, they might customize it, might polish it, might put some stuff on it. But fundamentally, it's an ETA movement that anyone could buy. And so in some cases, you have watches that are indistinguishable, like fake watches that are indistinguishable from the real thing. <laughs> So um, movement is a term to describe the mechanical parts in there? Is that Yes. So the okay. movement would be the things that move inside the watch. So that's the actual the piece that 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 keeps the time and does the the watches and stuff. And most most like this is sort of the difference between what people consider like super high end watches, like the, the gold standard is a producer that makes their own movement in house. So it's a custom movement that they make, versus most brands actually don't do that. Most brands like Panerai is a good example. They're a big brand, but they, they don't manufacture their own movements. They buy them from the Swatch group, uh, put hmm. them in, customize them, maybe uh, make their own sort of case around it and brand and stuff and sell it. Um, but it, very often it can be the same exact same movement from ETA um, that goes into a thousand dollar watch that goes into an eight thousand dollar watch. It's just a matter of, you know, marketing and branding uh, and perception, really. Hmm. And then on the fake side, like, you know, the most popular watches are the most fake. So like, you know, a Rolex, the Rolex Submariner is the most popular watch in the world, I think, in terms of volume, like on the high end. And that's also the most faked watch. And <laughs> the like there's a, there's even like a, a, a geekery around fake watches. <laughs> so there are people who are like, who look down on crap fakes, they but they really revere good fakes and they don't ever <laughs> want to buy the real thing. Okay. So they will be, you know, and, and honestly, the differences are subtle, not only like, not only on the face of the watch, like the white, the weight might be exactly the same. The feel might be exactly the same. Like, like yeah. everything is exactly the same, except with like tiny little differences, you know, like there might be that, um, the way, so, you know, on some, on some date watches, you have a date window that you have a magnifier, a little magnifier on, and mm -hmm. it might be the way in which at a certain angle, the magnifying bit distorts the date window at certain angles. That's all that's really the only way to tell that it's fake. And in some cases too, most of the time you if you if you have a watchmaker open up the back of a watch and look at the movement, then they can tell it's fake because um it's not a real say Rolex movement. But these days now there are mostly Chinese uh manufacturers that actually manufacture replicas of the Rolex movement to the point mm. where it's actually hard if you don't know what you're looking at. To, to even look at the movement and say, yeah, this is, this is not a Rolex movement. And the differences there might be things like, you know, the polishing on some of the pieces might be slightly off or like it's slightly rough on the little things that go on. But fundamentally, if you have a, 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 a great fake from that's, you know, that's a great fake Rolex in many ways, it might be functioning exactly the same. It might mm -hmm. have the same power reserve. So it might last for, you know, seven, two hours, same as a real one. It may actually mechanically be very similar or almost identical. Um, but the difference is, you know, you can buy a good fake Rolex Submariner probably for 500 bucks um, versus the same one in the gray market would probably cost you $15,000. <laughs> hmm. So, and often you end up in a scenario where it's like people will buy fake watches and then they will know what makes the fake stand out. And so they will swap in genuine parts to, to remedy that it was what I call Frank wow. watch. So, so for work. example, for the, yeah, for the Submariner, like there's a certain part of the bridge basically on the movement inside the watch, which is very different. Like mm. it's just, they haven't replicated that piece. They've used a different you know, piece to make it. I don't know why, because maybe they couldn't make it work or too complicated or something, but you can go and buy on eBay. You can buy a genuine piece for this movement that cost you, I don't know, 500 bucks or something. And if you swap that in, that piece in and do one or two other things, then it becomes almost impossible. Even if you have a watchmaker open the back of the watch to tell that it's fake. Hmm. So you're not convincing me to in invest in watches <laughs> in any way. I don't think anyone should. Like really, like unless you really like watches and you, like you, you, I mean, part of me too is like, I, en I enjoy the fact that there's like shenanigans in this space. <laughs> Yeah. I don't really think of it as like a serious, like there are people who think of it as like serious investments and, and people do yeah. make a living from it for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's like, like, for example, this watch, 
to this yeah. one here. It's a 1978 yeah. Rolex 5500. So it's my okay. birth watch year. So it's I mean, oh. the year I was born. And it's a Rolex 5500 Air King. But I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, so if you look at it, you see how it has the 963 on there? The 12 okay. and the 963. Yeah. It has what's called the Explorer dial. So I'm pretty sure that's an aftermarket dial because the difference between an Air King model of this, which is will cost you about two, three thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. But Rolex also in 1978 in the 70s made Explorer dial versions of, of this particular watch. And the only difference was the dial, like the actual what it looked like and the hands. If you have a real one of those and you have the provenance, so that includes the original paperwork and all that stuff. It's no longer a three thousand dollar watch. It's a thirty thousand, twenty five, thirty thousand dollar watch. Hmm. So hmm. this is probably the hardest. This, for real collectors, people don't collect this watch because it's so easy to fake. <laughs> like all you wow. got to do is buy one Air King for about, you know, two three thousand bucks. Buy a dial, put it in, put the new hands in, and it's indistinguishable from a twenty five to thirty thousand dollar watch. So where did you learn about watches? And if somebody's listening to this, and I don't know why you would listen to this and then think, yes, I want to put tens of thousands into watches, but suppose someone did, where would they go yeah. to learn more about this? Where did you learn so, about it? I mean, honestly, Reddit is, is actually quite a good source for this. Huh. You know, it's one of those things where like the, each, pretty much each, uh, each brand, people are very brand focused again on this. So people will care, people will care about being a Rolex guy. They don't care about, care about understanding the history of Rolex, the various models, like plus uh, minuses. There are snobs in every single subreddit, watch subreddit on, on Reddit. So I would encourage people, if you're interested, you know, go check out, you know, there's watches, dot, you know, this slash R slash watches, which is one thing or vintage watches. Yep. But if you're into it, you know, start looking at um, some of the, the brand specific ones. There are people there who are really, truly into it and are like several hundred thousand dollars into watches. And then there are people who make who make good money. Yeah. I mean, the way that I think about it is like it's a bit like my partner, Rob, like he connects. He collects uh, comic books. Like I couldn't care. I couldn't give a shit about comic books. I don't care. Mm. But that's what he's really into. Yeah. And, it, you know, I, I feel like most people, if they have, you know, an investment portfolio, you know, why not spend two to 5% of your, you know, on your, of your wealth on something that gives you pleasure, other, even if the asset class itself is perhaps a little stupid, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, why not? I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's partly why I do it. I'm yeah. like, it's, it's, it provides me something. It scratches an itch that both crypto investing and startup investing and, and indexing doesn't, doesn't provide for me. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on here today uh, and talking about this. Uh, I am actually, I'm, I'm scheduled to talk to Rob soon, so we'll learn more about uh, folks uh, co uh, investing in, in collectibles. But uh, it's it's interesting to me. I, you can't, I don't, I, I don't know how much, how many gallons of diesel you can get for that watch <laughs> that you have there, or if it comes down to that, maybe, you know, you can trade it. Uh, for for wheat berries in the street, something like that. When uh, you know, when for when, really when the Mad Max comes and, and like the world is ending. At least here's the nice thing yeah, about exactly. mechanical watch, though. When the power grid goes down, you're fine because you're just a mechanical watch. Yeah, you just find it up for all time. This when the world is ending. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's for you'll have it like uh, right down within within three seconds. Um, Plus minus, yeah, and, yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, man. Awesome <laughs> having you here. Thanks for jumping on talking about this stuff. And uh, we'll talk to you uh, uh, again soon.